Okay, so for this tutorial, we're going to be looking at some slightly more complex scenarios to do with income, and particularly in terms of uh, compensation to start with. So, this first scenario that we have is to do with uh, a, uh, an organization, a company having uh, an exclusive distribution agreement um, with an overseas organization. And this agreement uh, gets cancelled, so it's cancellation of a contract. And so we, we're we going to be looking at the $10 million that's paid to determine whether or not it is, uh, it's going to be income or it's, uh, it's going to be on, on capital or capital receipt. Um, the other two payments we're going to be looking at is the, for the CEO, um, being paid out his salary and other entitlements, um, the $80,000. And we're going to look at the twenty thousand um, dollars that they're paying uh, for his medical expenses and um, and depression. Now, I'd like to think of this as being, uh, I guess, a slightly more complex IRAC or IPAC style question. So here we're looking at really one high-level um, issue, which is whether or not these amounts are uh, included under assessable income. And then we're going to go through each one of them and examine these. Now, I do recommend for those, again, particularly doing law, but certainly um, uh, in subjects where it's applicable under the business degree as well, that when answering things using this IPAC or IRAC method, that you try to break things up into manageable chunks. It's really not great reading for a client, and again I'm thinking in, as, uh, in terms of law firms, to be reading a page worth of rules before there's any mention of them or their matter or their, um, their situation. And so my rule of thumb is that if explaining these rules or principles really is going to take more than about four rules, so over you know, a half dozen or so lines, almost always that needs to be broken up into a series of smaller issues. And each of those smaller issues can be phrased as a question itself. Now, here we've got, um, we're talking about assessable income and we're talking about compensation payments, uh, Meeks's case, and we're talking about the fruit and the tree for all three of these. And so it's quite applicable um, when answering a question like this to have uh, or, or at least explain sort of the high level rules at the top. Hey, look, is the amount, uh, are these amounts assessable income? Well, amounts, all types of in, um, amounts payable as compensation take on the same character as the receipt they replace. And that's true for all of these. So you're not repeating yourself throughout. Um, however, there are going to be some very specific rules for each of those three types. And so here um, I've uh, structured this as a series of, I guess, of sub-issues. And each of those sub-issues is a question. And so starting with these high-level rules, um, the fruit, the tree, and Mix's case, then we move on to the $10 million cancellation. And there's a few cases there, the California Oils and Allied Mills. And where basically, it's all to do with whether you're killing the tree or not. If you've got a very large entity and sure they, they've lost a distribution channel or a product line uh, some part of their business needs to to you know, to be closed down or modified or changed in some way really this is just changing or modifying their income streams it's only when things form a really large part of the business or indeed sends the entire business uh, broke that the courts are going to deem this to be capital in nature. And so that's, that's um, this distinction for, between when you've got a large entity and they're only losing or having to modify um, a fraction of their business, a smallish fraction. That's Allied Mills. If it really just kills the whole thing, damages the tree, and I think the analogy of the tree is quite useful here. If the tree's going to die, then it's going to be a capital transaction. So. Here, we're looking at um, Sellers Limited. It's quite difficult to say. We don't know how large Sellers Limited actually is. This could be a, a billion dollar company or it could be 
that all of their revenue comes from this um, exclusive distribution. It's difficult to say. Um, arguably, though, uh, it's probably just uh, an income stream, and uh, although it doesn't matter which, which way when we're describing it here, the I'd probably argue that it's uh, it's going to be on income account. So next we look at the uh, cancellation of an employment contract. This is actually quite straightforward. When a person's paid out and they've got entitlements, leave, uh, annual leave, and uh, and so on, and they've got present wages and they've got potential future wages and income and other entitlements, it's usually just going to be income. It's ordinary income, and so that again, go back to Meeks's case, takes on the, the same character as what it's replacing. It's this is the fruit. This is not the tree, it's the fruit, it's the result of the person's personal effort. We're compensating the person for that. That's going to be income. However, the $20,000 cancellation, uh, or I should say reimbursement of medical expenses, is probably going to be capital. Why? Well, again, it's that tree and fruit analogy. Where a person's earning capacity itself, which is a capital asset, when that's reduced, that's deemed by the courts to be capital in nature, and that's slava. Um, and where you've got um, personal injury and occupation, there's a specific section in the 97 um, Act, the Income Tax Act, which uh, states that you actually disregard the capital gain as well. So that $20,000 is on the capital account, but you're not even liable for CGT. And just make note here, as this is one of these, uh, an IRAC type problem with lots of issues and rules that I've explained and analysed separately, the conclusion though ties all of these things together. And that's one of the, I guess, the elegant ways of, of using this style of method in that you're not having to do a little conclusion for your client in multiple places in your document. Because at the end of the day, they just need to know in one spot and often very, very succinctly what the result is going to be. So here, $10 million capital gain, 20 k is neither assessable income and in fact it's exempt from capital gains as well and the 80 k um, to Dan is going to be regular assessable income. Okay, now this is one of the trickier parts in the subject, uh, at least conceptually, for those that, um, particularly those that aren't involved in economics or finance. And this is this idea of debt defeasance where we have debts and we're making arrangements with third parties to do things with that debt and in particular reaping some form of tax benefit as a result. And we're also going to be looking uh, after that at discounts and premiums. So my advice on questions like this is take your time. Actually go and carefully read through these and again this there's, there's not very many words on this page but the underlying concepts here take a little bit of time for it to sink in and certainly when um, answering uh, an exam type question spend a bit of time to read particularly to try and work out who the parties are where the money's going and why now when looking at this scenario it it's a little bit uh, sort of mind bending in terms of what the various parties are seeking to achieve here now it is something that comes up in in law, certainly in the academic uh, sense, where you've got an unusual situation like this. Often, the scenarios come from a particular case or series of cases, and certainly that's what we have here: the two cases of Orica and Unilever. Now, here the problem question given to us um, it doesn't even specify when taking over the obligations whether that's referring to um, uh, principal and interest or principal only. Uh, but it really doesn't matter in terms of answering this question because what the person asking it is trying to get uh, you to, to realise and understand is the distinction between Orica and Unilever and that is largely that one of them was in the business of doing this, um, these sorts of arrangements which was the Unilever case. So for Orica it's not a finance company and so performing this uh, sort of debt defeasement arrangement, you know, and it 
may have just been a one-off situation, but the the High Court there was was happy to say that this is going to be on capital account. It's a capital transaction. It's not something you do regularly, and you didn't intend to make a profit from it. Now with Unilever, the very similar facts. However, the um, they were a finance house, and so that when they are performing this, and they did it more regularly, and they were seeking to make a profit, then in that situation, look, that's just going to be straight up income. And so, coming back to the um, the issue at hand in a, our particular problem scenario, we just don't know. We actually don't know whether or not this organisation is in the business of performing these uh, sorts of arrangements. Um, the other thing just to note is that when um, in this situation Entity X repays the principal back to um, B, that's the point in time where uh, the capital gain event actually comes uh, into place for, um, for A, for, the, for our taxpayer. Because that's the point in time where, you've, um, where the users crystallise the gain or the loss, it can be determined. So here we're talking about loan discounts and premiums. And again, this is another quite um, difficult area to wrap your head around. It, the, the helpful thing, helpful piece of advice when having a question like this is to just carefully read the problem to try and determine what it is that the two parties are trying to do here. Um, and there's usually a, a little bit of simple calculations. So here you've got one company um, seeking to raise uh, some funds has issued some notes um, for a thousand dollars with an interest rate of five percent but they have this special amount that is to be repaid of a hundred dollars per thousand dollar note and so the first thing you do here is just a simple calculation what is the actual I guess real interest rate that's happening there and we've got a one year period and you've got 5% uh, interest which is what $50 per note and an additional $100 so really what you've got there on a thousand dollar note is a 15% I guess real interest rate but the names they use are, complete, are quite different now where this is uh, where you've got this discount or this premium um, that's offered on loans the, um, the courts they basically look at what the underlying transaction is, what's actually happening here. It is however okay, and the courts are happy to say it is okay to have and use these things and and this part's a little bit tricky, uh, particularly for the accounting students in this office to get their heads around, is that this premium, this comes from the case of Lomax and Peter Dixon, is really to compensate for the um, for the potential capital loss of the entire thing going pear shaped. Now, as we know in from finance and accounting, that interest rates are essentially just a reflection of risk. It's that idea that well, the higher the percentage, then the larger the risk, the the likelihood that you're going to have of losing the lot. But at law, uh, I guess in many ways slightly unhelpfully, they're happy to make this sometimes artificial distinction. And so the facts, for example, in Lomax and Peter Dixon was when uh, an investment in Finland, uh, and it was looking like in the, during the war that Finland was going to be invaded by the Soviets, and the Soviets had no love of foreign corporations, and so the investment would be would be lost. And so this, this idea of um, issuing uh, notes or, or loans in some form and having an interest rate the courts look at what uh, I guess the background commercial rate is and if you were to get a question like this in a take-home uh, question or an exam you'd really be wanting to know or th even think about if you, from, from your own background information what is a commercial rate at the moment um, is it closer to 5% or is it closer to 15% because if the real underlying commercial risk is uh, you know, makes the thing essentially close to 15% anyway, the courts are just going to look underneath this transaction and say, look, this is just all interest. 
Whereas if a commercial lending rate would be around the 5% uh, chance and there was this real genuine um, you know, risk that the entity is just going to go belly up, then the courts can deem this premium to be uh, of a capital nature. Hey, look, we're having this transaction at essentially 5% or something close to it, close to a market rate, but we're pu also putting aside this, this larger chunk um, on capital account to make up for the fact that, well, the whole thing might go belly up. And the courts there will look at the specifics of that particular firm rather than the underlying market itself. Now, just one final thing in an IRAC style question like this, we don't have that background knowledge. And so just make note, it's quite a common thing to just make note to the, um, uh, to the marker. Look, look, hey, we need more information in order to really give any sort of structured, solid advice. If the commercial rate's high, then it's, you know, it's more likely to be income, whereas if it's quite close to 5%, then that premium may be on capital account. That's a good way of, of going about answering this style of question. For the next question, we're going to look at extraordinary business uh, income or capital gain. Now, this is it's actually quite a lot of reading uh, for what's essentially quite a simple scenario. The idea is that an entity purchased a, a packet of land and intended to use it themselves. They intended to build their head office there and put a substation in. Later on, it becomes apparent that, look, they can't do that. Look, it's not economically viable. Um, and so quite some period later, some uh, 25 years later, they go, or they don't go to sell it, they enter into um, a contract with an, uh, a third party to jointly develop it and they will essentially sell the land itself and then lease it back again. And they get a good sum of money from doing that. Now, of course, our friend the tax commissioner comes along and says, hey, look, you bought this for a million dollars, you sold it for five million dollars, you've made four million dollars profit, we would like a share of tax, please. And so what you're doing here is essentially just advising the internal clients. And the key cases uh, to look at are Westfield, Whitford's Beach, and, um, and Myers. It's this idea that some entities, they're in the business of property development. That's what they do. And they make their money that way. They buy things, they develop them, they on-sell them. But gains that are made in the course of those style of businesses, they're just going to be ordinary income. They're made uh, as the result of the business's normal occupation. However, the flip side of that is that if you're an entity that is not in the business of buying and selling property, it is not your a, a core part or component of your business, and you didn't actually intend to make a profit uh, when you were purchasing that particular plot of land, then the gains that you make are going to be considered to be capital gains. They're not related to the, your core business goals and aims and your objectives. So really this is quite a, a straightforward scenario despite its length. The taxpayer is in the business of electricity. It's about retailing them and distributing electricity. It's not about property development. And there's clear evidence in the scenario that when they purchased that plot of land, they didn't intend to on sell it for a profit. They actually intended to use it. They had plans, well laid out plans, admittedly, that didn't come into fruition. But they can demonstrate to the commissioner that they weren't, when purchasing this land, seeking to make a profit from it. That wasn't the primary purpose of doing that. So it's capital gain and because the acquisition is, was before the 20th of September 1985, it's uh, tax-free capital gain. There is no capital gain on assets that are purchased before that point in time. And so in conclusion, it's a $4 million capital gain, but there's no tax payable on that, um, on that transaction. The next thing we're looking at is trading stock. Now, trading stock in tax law requires some pretty basic um, arithmetic. 
and these style of questions are quite popular in terms of um, popping up in uh, things like take home assignments and exams. So it's helpful when doing these, in fact with all questions really, to carefully go through and read them to just determine what it is that you're trying to work out and often with a, a, a trading stock you'll you'll be trying to work out what the um, taxable income is going to be as a result of, of doing things and also how you can go about in terms of making an election. Um, it's really a strategic uh, question as well. And when answering these I do not recommend to, to do this IRAC style. I recommend to do it um, uh, to answer it as you might answer something like a mathematics problem where it's a, a series of steps that you're going through however because this is still a law subject and the law discipline you do need to cite, you actually have a source for the particular rules or principles that you're, um, that you're explaining as you go and so here for example um, we can mention that uh, the calculation from uh, trading stock comes from Division 70 of the 97 Act and state what the formula is, gross earnings less gross outgoings plus closing stock less opening stock. It's a pretty simple formula. Okay, you, I suggest you also mention what each of these things is. So um, opening stock is the previous tax year's closing stock. You cannot change that. That's an important consideration to note that we'll get to. And that income from trading, it's, it's not a capital gain. It's simply, this is a revenue calculation. Um, but it's mapped out by the statute in terms of how to do this calculation. So here, quite simply, our earnings were five thousand dollars, two and a half thousand dollars, five million dollars. There's you take away two and a half million dollars for the outgoings, add back the closing stock, and take away the opening stock. The net result there is three million dollars to add to your taxable income. The last thing we'll look at is the strategy. So where we've got uh, trading stock and we're about to value it at the end of the period to determine uh, what our closing stock is, the Commissioner, or rather Parliament, when they pass the Income Tax Act, uh, gives the taxpayer the option of valuing your closing stock at either cost or market or replacement. You can choose. It's quite remarkable the amount of flexibility this gives trading entities in order to, um, I guess, a tool to manage their um, their income uh, over multiple periods, and particularly periods where they might sustain losses. Being able to manipulate this can be a very useful strategic tool. So in the first half of this problem, we uh, elected to value the closing stock at cost, and that made a profit of $3 million. Now the closing stock there with that valuation it's uh, 1.5 million whereas the problem scenario says well if we do that at market it'll be uh, two and a half million dollars that we could value it at and that would increase our profit by a million dollars in the current year. In theory it'll produce it by a million dollars in the next year but that's, um, that's still to come. Or we could value it at replacement value and if we think about this quite logically, these numbers are, are, um, are, are pretty useful proxies. Is that idea that, look, what things are going to cost us if we're a trading entity is surely going to be lower than, um, than what we would, in theory, have to re replace them for, the cost of cost us to replace them, um, given inflation and so on. And the amount of their market value is going to be more again, because, well, hey, that's where we're selling them at in the marketplace. So uh, again, uh, the accountants is it pretty obvious to those listening to this um, this video that valuing your closest stock at market is going to increase your your profit in the current period, whereas valuing them at, at cost is going to um, give uh, give you the smallest profit for the current period. And replacement, uh, most of the time, is going to be uh, some value in between those. So if the entity is seeking to maximise their profit in the current year and minimise it for uh, say the next tax year, then valuing at market's the way to go. Um, and uh, the reverse is true. If you're trying to minimise your profit in the current year, then you would value things at cost. 
So I, I hope that this, um, this tutorial video has been useful and um, uh, I wish you luck um, taking this material and producing um, your own answers to these tutorial problems and questions.